Good evening and welcome. My name is Naomi Hausman, and I am proud to serve as the Director of Institutional Advancement at Gratz College. Thank you all of, thanks to all of you for joining us tonight uh, for the Gratz College Schusterman Distinguished Scholar Lecture. This lecture is the realization of the vision of Murray H. Schusterman of blessed memory. He was a community leader who served for many years on the Gratz College Board of Governors. With the generous endowment he established, Gratz brings outstanding scholarly lectures to the community each year. I would like to thank his son, Robert Schusterman, and for also Bob's daughter, Melissa Schusterman, who I'm thrilled to share is one of the newest members of the Gratz College Board of Governors. Welcome to you both. I welcome you and also thank you for the, and the entire Schusterman family for your wonderful and committed support and leadership over so many years. Before we get started, a few important notes about tonight's program. First, there will be an opportunity to engage in Q&A in the latter portion of the program. Please share any questions or comments you may have in the Q&A on your Zoom toolbar. Uh, and just please know that only the moderators and presenters tonight will be able to see what you enter in the Q&A. Also want to make sure you know that the program will be recorded and shared with all people who registered once it has been made public on our YouTube channel. And now it is my great, great pleasure and honor to introduce our Schusterman Distinguished Scholar, Rabbi Dr. Zev Elif, the president of Gratz College. He is the author and editor of nine books and more than 50 scholarly articles. And he comes to us most recently from Chicago where he served as chief academic officer of Hebrew Theological College and Vice Provost of Toro College, Illinois. Welcome, President Elif. We are very excited to engage in learning with you this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, really a credit to you and your team for uh, so much that you do. Uh, development and institutional advancement really should be the incubators of learning uh, really now globally uh, that Gratz is able to achieve. And uh, I'm so grateful. And on behalf of Gratz, uh, thank you. Uh, I found out only yesterday uh, that my mother actually uh, worked with uh, Murray Schusterman. Didn't know that until just yesterday, uh, but very glad to be a partner to the Schusterman family. Uh, and most closely, of course, for Melissa for recently joining our board. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if it's available for the attendees, but uh, from where I'm perched as a panelist, I see so many uh, board members and stakeholders and friends at Gratz College. Uh, certainly would like to uh, thank all of you for joining this evening. Our business today is to answer a question. The end of Jewish learning, a vision for the digital age. Don't mean to spoil anything, but the answer is no, it is not the end of Jewish learning. Um, what we're experiencing today, I think for many of us, is seen as rather unprecedented. And here is an, uh, an excerpt happily from the Philadelphia Jewish Exponent uh, from, from a colleague of mine, uh, Sarah Wolkenfeld, who's one of the leaders of Sepharia, probably the, uh, the, the largest online Jewish library, uh, freely available. Uh, here's what Sarah had to say. We want to help about Sepharia, this, oh, I'm going to Google it at your leisure. Uh, and Google is going to come up frequently in our discussion this evening. We want to help younger people overcome the sense of distance they may feel toward the text, said Sarah Wolkenfeld, Director of Education at Safaria, for the teen and tween age, didn't know such a thing existed, when there's a lot of pressure about the B'nai Mitzvah, for instance. It makes it less intimidating to know this information is just a click away. And that's exactly what it is. Hey, Google. Hey, Siri. What is the answer to my question today? Continues, Wolkenfeld. Text provides a starting point for a lot of people. They want to know, does Judaism have anything to teach me about gun violence? food justice, homelessness. They can use Safaria 
to teach, to search, excuse me, for these themes and be connected with the relevant texts and commentaries, Wolkenfeld said, people should be connected to the richness of literary tradition and Safaria is designed to show users that all of these texts are in conversation with each other. And it's not just a Jewish issue. It's important to offer some context in case one thought this was a virtual background. That one of a great researcher of our time in, uh, in education is Sam Weinberg in his recent book, 2018, Why Learn History, parenthetically in the subtitle, when it's already on your smartphone. And so it can go both ways. On the one hand, the democratization of learning of available text study, and by text, I mean actual text, but also audio and video images, all sorts of primary and secondary sources just available at your fingertips if you are within Wi-Fi bandwidth, has to be measured against some of the challenges. If everything's available, then how do we flex our muscles? How do we exercise? our minds. What do we do with that information? Uh, what happens educationally when there may not be a need for a spelling test ever again? We may not need to ever ask when the Norman invasion took place, 1066, or when Rashi was born, 1040, and when he died, 1105. We don't need to ask those questions. They're available with, in, in milliseconds with the appropriate Google search. On the other hand, what is lost by offering this transactional memory to our devices, to our artificial intelligence? Well, I'm here and I'd like to submit that this really isn't a new issue, but in fact, it's probably one of many stages, but certainly the third in a, a tripartite a uh, view of Jewish history, a view of Jewish history which understands that while technology changes, the issues and the fundamental questions that were asked might yield some wisdom for our time today, for a contemporary moment. So the first source and everything here is available in both Hebrew and English. I think it's important also given the subject matter uh, that we avail ourselves to both the text in the original, but also in English translation. Always very important for me to democratize our study in that way. Nimsa Bir Metz. This is written by Rabbi David Gantz at Semach David shortly after the invention of movable type. And you'll see why it's important. There was such a man in the city of Mainz a Gentile fellow, Gentile to Gans, of course, Ushmo Johannes Gutenberg, Strasbourg. There was such a person. Blessed is he who gives man the knowledge. This was my guy, writes the author of the Tzemach David. If there was anyone to celebrate in early modern Jewish history or world history for that matter, it is Gutenberg. Most scholars have only wonderful things to say about Gutenberg because he revolutionized text study. We're no longer transmitting our knowledge through papyrus. We now have movable type afforded to us. It was the invention of the library. And of course, other people, not the text in front of you, but also challenged it. What has Gutenberg done? He's unleashed a contagion, right? Other rabbinic authors. Now, anybody who was anyone can publish a work, doesn't need to be vetted in such a way, doesn't need the investment to have uh, scribes uh, transmit and write down various copies. Anyone can write text, write other rabbinic writers at this moment. And so that again, 
not everybody's of the same mind, but for many, Gutenberg was a good thing. And here you have the Tiferet Yisrael, Rabbi Yisrael Lifshitz, Vahare Gamlule Poa Kadosh, writing in his commentary on Tractate Avot, Shal Razal Sha'amru Lanu Kain. We can still say, based on the words of our sages, the sages that is of the Mishnah and the Talmud of the second, third, fourth, and fifth and sixth centuries, Kavar Hayinu Yodim Secha. The rabbinic mind, the Talmud, speaks very favorably about a category of, of Hasidei Umoto Olam. The Talmud is very open to wisdom and kindness that is generated outside of the Jewish people. But writes the author of the Tiferet Yisrael, I didn't really need the Talmud to teach me that. Because of course there's great wisdom and of course there's great kindness that comes outside of the Jewish people. It says so in scripture, in Psalms, Tzadik Hashem b'chol darcha b'chasid b'chol ma'asav, anyone can be a righteous person and follow in God's ways, but anachnu ro'im. And we have proof historically, writes Rabbi Lifshitz, but anachnu ro'im, we see with our own eyes, kama machas we see their kindness. Shemovad shemakirin yotzer bereshit, they recognize the glory of creation, umaminin b'torah kadosha, and in their own way, they understood, they intuited the holiness of the Pentateuch of the Torah, Shehi Elokit, that it was had a divinity attached to it. Vosin gimilut chasadim, and they did kindness, writes a rabbinic author about the non-Jewish population. Non-Jewish population, of course, seems quite silly. Non-Jews means that the nons are 98% of the world. Vosin gam gimilut chasadim, gam li Israel. And who are some examples? But Kama Mehen Sheituvu Biyoter Lechol Olam, and they have Jews and non-Jews alike. Uvahachasid. This is important for our own time and our own moment. It should go away speedily. Kachasid Yenner Shem Tzia, who was Edward Jenner. Of course, he invented the um, the Hopakon. Uh, it is the Hapakin Infug. What is it? The vaccine for smallpox. Shal yada, that on Jenner's invention, his discovery, Notzlim were saved, Kama Rivavot, B'nai Adam, Echoleu, Mimita, Mumayan. Tens of thousands of people were saved by Jenner with the invention of the vaccine. The Drake, and not only him, but also Sir Francis Drake, Shehevi, Hakrat Apple, the Europa, who brought, uh, who brought potatoes. Uh, and therefore was able to stave off famine, bringing potatoes to the continent was an extraordinary moment for humankind. And last but certainly not least is Gutenberg. Any published author has to make a special blessing in honor of Gutenberg's invention of movable type. But there's something remarkable about the 19th century. In the 19th century, stereotype print came in uh, to factories, which allowed not just movable type, but stereotype plates in order for in, not just uh, individual letters, but entire pages to be replicated over and over again in an inexpensive manner. Not only that, but also improved postal service and cheap binding and more affordable ways of producing paper made it so that newspapers and books were now really affordable. So now what a library wasn't just within the grasp of the elites, but even common folk could afford books at a much more reasonable price. And so no less that if we bring the story to America for just a moment, even though mostly we're gonna speak about Europe, is Isaac Mayer Wise, the architect of Reform Judaism. At this time, he was just a young rabbi in Albany, probably looked like the photo of him that we have uh, on the, in the upper section. He writes to his colleague, eventually his, I guess this was the first invention of the frenemy of Reverend Isaac Leeser, uh, the great champion of American Judaism, in particular Orthodoxy in Philadelphia, no less. Uh, writes wise to uh, Lisa, the editor of a newspaper, The Occident. I found The Occident in almost every house in Charleston. Wise was unhappy in Albany at the moment uh, in 1850 and was actually auditioning uh, for a position 
in what was then the second largest community in American uh, Jewish life, Charleston, South Carolina. And it was chiefly through its columns, writes Wise to Leeser, that I was recommended to the people, Temple Beth Elohim in Charleston, South Carolina, for which I am very grateful to you. And so people are transmitting information and they're dialoguing in a much speedier manner because the printed text is that much more powerful in the mid 19th century. And of course, it's not Jews. It's important to understand the context. One could have given a similar talk, I assume, for any faith, community, or small group, writes the great scholar of American Christianity, Nathan Hatch, this transformation in his democratization of American Christianity, this transformation of the religious press is a central theme in the growth of popular literature in the early republic, meaning the early 19th century. Evangelical belief in the power of print was also reinforced by the arresting possibilities of a new technology of printing. See, I didn't make it up. After the American Bible Society was founded in May of 1816, its board determined that their first exertions ought to be directed towards the procurement of well-executed stereotype plates. Similarly, the availability of inexpensive stereotyping was a principal reason for the consolidation of several societies into the American Tract Society in 1825 and for its locating in New York City. In other words, explains Hatch, and you can transmit this to the American and the European Jewish communities as well, is that religious leaders, professional and lay alike, understood the power of this print medium, that we could transmit it quickly, we can articulate ourselves much better, and we can actually have a conversation and brought people finally much closer together. And what this did for the rabbinic mind was really call into question a Mishnah a statement by our sages uh, in the early, probably first or second century, um, that didn't receive much consideration until the 19th century, I would submit. Rebbe Dostai bar Rebbe Yanai Mishum Rebbe Meir Omer. We have a tradition, do the sages in the name of Rabbi Meir of the second century, Anyone who deigns to forget, quite purposely, I would imagine, uh, their teachings, their learning, if they forget it, the scriptures teach us, it's if they've surrendered their very existence. Shne'emar, as it says in Deuteronomy, Raki shamar lachav u'shamar nafshecha me'od pentishkach atvarim asher ra'u e'nacha. Just be careful and verily guard your soul, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. And what the sages extrapolated from that statement in scripture was that forgetfulness is something to beware. It is both something, it is a, it is a, uh, its own form of intellectual contagion. And as we'll see in a moment, it could also be understood as a punishment for inappropriate handling of, of religious life. What do I mean by that? First is Maimonides. This is probably not what Maimonides looked like. This is how he appears in uh, Washington, D.C. in a sculpture that was, uh, I think it was Brenda Putnam was the uh, sculpture artist in the 1950s. Uh, this matter is agreed. What does uh, Maimonides write on this particular statement in the Mishnah? He writes, Dovers and Muskamalav Mina Philosophim. Maimonides, of course, the Aristotelian philosopher, understood this in philosophical terms. They often describe the rungs of wisdom in such a fashion that denote the uppermost rungs as Kinyan Chazak. What Maimonides understood is what the Mishnah was in thinking in concert with Greek philosophers, is that one has to strive to make sure that one locks their learning, that they can't possibly forget it. And unless you exercise such uh, pressures on your memory banks, then you're never going to study it. But in truth, the sages uh, had nothing nice to say about forgetfulness. It was the worst sort of evil that they could face. Amar Rebbe Elazar, a passage in Tractate Yuma, anybody who deliberately, I'm going to uh, editorialize, 
forgets their learning, Gorim Galut Levada, their descendants will be sent into exile. Of our Rebbe Lazar, this is from Kedushan, we're traveling across the Talmud right now. Of our Rebbe Lazar, Kol Tamid Chacham Shein Omei Bifnei Rabo, any scholar who doesn't exercise uh, humility and arises, stands up for their teacher when that teacher is in front of his or her presence, Nikra Rasha, such a person is wicked. The Inu Ma'arich Yamim, and the punishment for not uh, demonstrating appropriate regard, reverence for one's teacher uh, is you won't live that long and apparently just as bad of a punishment, and their learning will fall into a void, be absolutely forgotten and neglected. Similarly, Tractate Sanhedrin, Amar Ula, Machshava Mu'elet, anxieties. And this actually I can relate to, I'll submit. Um, anxieties affect everything. When one is worried, when one is overeager, they tend to forget things. And this applies equally to um, all wisdom, but specifically with uh, Torah study. He frustrates the devices of the clever so that their hands cannot perform anything substantial. And finally, returning back to the uh, text of the Mishnah itself from Avot, from the uh, sayings of our forefathers, Amar Reish Lakish, anyone who has deliberately forgotten one iota of their learning, it's as if they've committed a sin, a lav. Just one more. Um, is Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Amar Shmuel, Shoshad Alafim Halacha, Nishachu B'yemei Avlo Shal Moshe. And after the death of Moses, the sages teach us, perhaps homiletically, but when they lost their master, Moses in the wilderness, they forgot 3,000 items of his teaching. So with that as a background, quite ominous, intuitively, scholars, and I've given you their dates, all flourishing in the early 19th century at a moment in which books were more readily available, look to reassess that keen um, Talmudic wisdom. Namely, is one allowed to forget their learning or do we have to be as scrupulous? Do we have to be as circumspect uh, about retaining our teaching of our wisdom? First position is from the first grand rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liaidi, the Alter Rebbe of Chabad, the first grand rabbi of Chabad, the, writes in his own uh, legal writing. Anyone who forgets their learning because they didn't review it enough, they looked at it too quickly, uh, they didn't give it uh, the old college try. So he too editorialized, doesn't mean forgetting. If one doesn't have a great memory, that's what we're talking about. We're speaking rights to Alter Rebbe of one who uh, just passes through. He just glances at the learning and he or she uh, doesn't give it, doesn't afford it the appropriate opportunity to stick. That person has surrendered their soul. The gum over Bilav. And what we learned from Reish Lakish, they've also committed a sin. Bilav shall Torah. And this applies back then, and it applies now in the early 19th century. Because you might have thought, because Torah is all written down, but all the oral traditions are all written down. You can just grab a textbook and look in a table of contents and find it. I forgot it, but that's okay, because I know exactly where it is. I arranged my library accordingly, and there's a back index, many good scholarly work. So I'll quickly retrieve it, or I'll Google it. Einza Moaklum. Doesn't help at all. Nothing has changed because technology has afforded us easier access to text. Kimiyad sheshachach over belav. Because as soon as you forget, if you're capable of remembering and you don't, then that's when the sin, that's when the problem kicks in. Kamod uh, be a man. And it, same thing in our days. Sha'over Bilav, it's also as egregious. If you forget, and then you say, ah, what well, was it again? I'll look at it again. A day later, a moment later. 
doesn't matter why, because it's about the effort. According to the Alter Rebbe, the problem with, the, with not giving it enough effort to recall your learning isn't about having the background, the lucidity of recalling the text, but is the effort, it is the intellectual exercise in Limura Torah, in Torah study and scholarship. If you're not giving it your all, then it doesn't matter how easily accessible it is. That's the position of the Alter Rebbe. But you see the fact that he's asking the question is critically important. Now, if we're gonna quote the Alter Rebbe, one of the leaders of early Hasidut, then we should quote the, the leader of the so-called Minagdim, those opposed to Hasidut. It seems only fair. This is a tradition we have from the students of Rabbi Chaim of Volazhin, who founded the very the Eitz Chaim Yeshiva, the very first yeshiva in, in Lithuania in 1802. Shalatav, they were, he was asked about the Indian, about the idea of Shochech Dafar Echad Mimishnata. He was asked about this. So it was, it was a live question about what is this about forgetfulness? We read about it all the time in our tomes, in our rabbinic tomes. Is it still in play? Vehishiv. And Rabbi Chaim of Vlazhin answered, This only applies in that erstwhile time. Because they had an oral tradition, they didn't have texts. And if they didn't learn it, they probably weren't going to learn it again. But for us, it didn't say because we have access to texts. So while for the Alta Rebbe, it was the exercise, the activity, the intellectual activity of Torah study, for Rabbi Chaim of Volazhin, it was about, it was about access to text. And if you have access, then that's quite fine. It's very similar to the Gutenberg conundrum that we saw earlier. Now, also at this time, Rabbi Shlomo Kluger has a similar position to Rabbi Chaim of Volazhin, uh, but he explains it in different ways. Fascinating narrative at the end of a little known, tra little study tractate called Horiot. Um, these groups of sages had a debate. One position had it that some who is who should be uh, uh, who should be hired as Rosh Yeshiva, who should be hired as professor of Jewish studies. Should it be the person who is a Sinai, somebody who doesn't ever forget anything? And the other person suggested, no, no, no. It's about somebody who has the power of analysis. Sinai, of course, is Mount Sinai. It is represents the totality of wisdom and learning. And the other position has, no, no, someone who's able to flip the mountain around and extrapolate and the power of deduction, understand new and creative insights. So who's greater? Who should we hire? Which skill set uh, redounds better to our institution? Rabbi Yosef was a Sinai. Rabbi Yosef was, a, said was a, somebody who retained a lot of memory. Rava Okerharim and Rava, it was, a, it was, there was such a, they were the finals. They were the candidates for a professorship. And the other one was, had, was incredibly creative. They didn't know the answer in Babylonia. So they sent the question to Israel. Which one should we choose? They sent back a Sinai, one who retains, one who has a prodigious memory is better. To Amar Mar, because we have such a, a quip. Because we all need the storehouses of wheat. You can't flip over mountains unless you have the mountain. So such a person was preferable. So writes Rabbi Shlomo, Shlomo Kluger, Ledati, in Raya Minashas. Again, in the 19th century, part of this technological advancement. And I don't see any responsa, any rabbinic literature I found predates the 19th century. Writes Rabbi Shlomo Kluger. I don't think so anymore. We don't prefer the person with the eidetic memory. I like the creative soul. Ledati ain't raya minashas. You can't prove it from that tractate horiot. De bismanam, because in their time, shalo hayu sfarim nivasim. They didn't have printed works. They're reading from scrolls. Mishum hachi And because they have easy access to text, of course, somebody who could, with total recall, was much preferable. But in our time, in the 19th century, in the 1800s, after you take out a book and you look at the table of contents, you could see, find whatever you're looking for. 
Lo shayach atam da kol tzrichei l'mar yachatia. This 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 adage of we all need the the guy who owns the wheat. That that's not a, a primary uh, concern at this point. Lakach therefore charifadi somebody who is sharp, somebody who is creative. That person is the ranking genius of our time. Vivnei. It turns out that Rabbi Shlomo Kluger was probably closer to the creative genius than the one with the eidetic memory, it turns out. The Laka Kharif Adif, then the creative genius was preferable. He, uh, he or she, that's the person you should hire. Midnei, Dehu, Motsi, Milibo, because but that person can extrapolate from their own intuition, from their own hearts. EF Charling Tsomimim. That's not something you can publish in a book. Now, here's my last position. We've had two so far. We've had forgetting is still in play, even with uh, the advancement in libraries and texts, because it's about the intellectual exercise of learning. That's Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liaidi. Rabbi Shlomo Kluger and Rabbi Chaim of Lajan, they look at it from a similar vantage point from two different texts, which suggests, no, no, things have changed. And the ability to... Uh, to commit your memory to text and make it available more readily, that suffices. We ought to flip our conventional wisdom. Here's a third approach, and I, I'll admit that I, I like this the most. Vesapik. This is Rabbi Avram David Varman in his commentary on Tractate Avot, the first Mishnah that we began about forgetfulness. Vesapik. I'm not sure. Shulai lo shayach bizman hazeh. I don't know. Again, 19th century. I'm not sure what to do with this Mishnah, with this saying, with this, uh, with this curation of wisdom at our present moment. Shekoa Torah hi bechtav. Everything is written down. Everything's available, just like we've rehearsed so far this evening. Gama shechitshu kol darot sh'ad ko b'tor whether it's the oral tradition, whether it's the written tradition, anything ever, anybody's ever committed to writing is readily available. And when I'm referring to is specifically with new ideas, with novel ideas. If anything, the the challenge here is that we're not allowed to forget our novel, our, our new ideas, because everything else, I don't know what blessing to recite. I don't know, should, uh, you know, in, in a mourner's house, what do you do here or there? You got texts available. It's about new ideas that haven't yet been written down. If it's only you. Everybody has this. We've all had our creative moments. We've all thought in an idea, uh, a novel idea, and I'll say a Torah idea, a Jewish idea, or any sort of idea. We've all had that spark, our moment, where we've had a novel enterprise enter our minds. If you, in your Torah, I remember I had a rabbinic colleague at a conference, he was, we were rabbinical students at the time. Uh, and this was a rabbinical student at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And he, he made a comment, I forget exactly the context, but he said, this is my Torah and I hope you find it to be good Torah. Everybody has their own Torah. Everybody has their own idea. And if that evaporates, if you forget your own personal contribution to humanity, if it's a fleeting moment and it just evaporates into the air, then it's gone. Then you've given up your opportunity to share your own personal wisdom with the rest of the world. Everybody has a moment in which they have unearthed, they have discovered, they have articulated something that was only done, only meant to be thought of by you. As Yesh Giron. And if you forget that, then the world is something lesser than it was when you had the chance to transmit it. So if there are three approaches to the, what I'm calling the democratization of Torah knowledge, 
The challenge to the experience of Torah study was our first approach, in which case you have to remember because remembering is an indication of serious and thoughtful study. Two, the 19th century does in fact represent a paradigm shift favoring creativity. What do you have to remember if it's all available on your smartphone? It's an opportunity to think differently about knowledge and about wisdom. And third, and I'll again confess, this is my favorite. This is the Divrei David, which we just learned together. It invigorates and fortifies communal Torah discourse. You're not allowed to forget because you owe it to your friends, to your children, to your grandparents, to inspire them with your own wisdom. And if you've forgotten that wisdom, then the world has forgotten about your wisdom. And so to extrapolate and bring it into the present, I'll share just a couple more slides. This is from a New York Times article in 2010 in Indonesia uh, about a, a, a burgeoning Jewish community there. Who would have thought? Uh, that left in the second paragraph, that left the synagogue in a town just outside of Menado, founded by Indonesians still struggling to learn about Judaism and now attended by about 10 people as Indonesia's sole surviving Jewish house of worship. Before reaching out in the bolded section, that's how you know it's important because I bolded it, before reaching out for help to sometimes suspicious Jewish communities outside of Indonesia, they, referring to the Jews there, researched Judaism at an internet cafe here. They turned, they said jokingly, to Rabbi Google for answers. They compiled the Torah, by printing pages off the internet. They sought the finer points of davening, of prayer on YouTube. The digital age enabled, empowered, made possible Jewish religious life of some sort in Indonesia. Rabbi Google to the rescue. And apparently it's a real thing because there's an image available on Google Images. Um, but a, uh, a colleague of mine, Rabbi Ochanan Pupko, wrote an article in the Baltimore Jewish Times not too long ago, about three years ago, and he put it quite nicely. Jewish schools, referring to day schools, and I would say this is camps, this is adult education, and this isn't a Jewish question as I began in the opening. This is a human being question. Jewish schools need to teach their students how to use the internet as a Judaic resource. He's, of course, writing before the pandemic, and now everybody's capacity for internet use is so much greater. There is no Jewish knowledge that can be imparted to students that is not available to them on the internet. This is Safari. Yeah, these are all the different tools and resources that our community supports and makes use up. In fact, many of the things that can be taught to adults already exist in cyberspace. Turning to the last paragraph, with the vast amount of knowledge in cyberspace, children need to know how to find what they want. They need to know how to navigate. A compass is more important than actually perhaps even reading certain texts. Um, children need to know how to find what they want, what platforms of knowledge are appropriate and helpful, and which ones are not. You have to be able to discriminate what is a good source and what is a not so great source. When things were vetted and only the elites were able to publish in magazines and books, then there was a natural vetting process. It was always perfect. Um, but now with the democratization, it allows anyone with a Twitter handle to propagate whatever vision, whatever ideas he or she, she may want. When can ask Rabbi Google and when you may want to ask an actual person. And in closing, I'll go with uh, that text um, by Sam Wine, brilliant series of essays uh, by a really terrific researcher of education pedagogy at Stanford. He writes at the close of his introduction, does Weinberg, does Professor Weinberg, in an age when no one regulates the information we consume, the task of separating truth from falsehood can no longer be for extra credit. Google can do many things, but it cannot teach discernment. Never has so much information been at our fingertips, but never have we been so ill-equipped to deal with it. I think perhaps a response to Weinberg and a kernel of wisdom from Jewish history is, uh, is what we learned is about the challenges of the democratization, the availability of texts, of the curations of wisdom. But I would 
argue that the wisdom of the Divrei David, of Rabbi Avram David Warman, about owning your text, you are your own personal text. If you care for it, if you are the custodian of that, and you cultivate and you develop it, and you're able to courageously share it, if you develop, if you unearth your own Torah, and you send it out there on the proposition that you think it's good Torah, well, already then we've been put into much better stead. Thank you so much. Dr. Ella, thank you so much. Um, that was very, very thoughtful and thought provoking. Um, so I'd like to open up uh, at this time uh, the floor to those who would like to pose a question in, uh, you can do so in the Q&A tool. Uh, so I'm gonna take a look here and see what's coming through. We have some, uh, what, uh, some, some great feedback that this was a great presentation. Um, so thank you for those comments. There are no solicitations tonight, um, you can be honest. <laughs> Um, so while we're waiting for some questions to come through, um, maybe you can uh, talk to us a little bit more about how, like sort of what emerges when you present this, this, this to uh, in other audiences, like what are sort of the most compelling questions well, that you I, I, this is, this, or the this, most this, difficult this, questions? Yeah. So this is something I've been thinking about for a while. I've never presented it as fully as uh, this evening. And so, so grateful, again, to be a part of uh, the Schusterman's legacy. I mean, just, just tremendous. Um, you know, I think this has um, practical implications, I think, for grads. You know, um, shouldn't come as any surprise. Um, I, I think that the way that we handle our own teaching and learning, whether it be in the graduate programs, in the education, in our Holocaust studies, and nonprofit, or in Jewish studies, or certainly in Gratz Academy, you know, all of this is a reminder is that um, we have to think about not how to know knowledge, but how to use knowledge. How do we, uh, how, how do we promote careful analysis and discernment like Weinberg uh, suggested. Um, how do our courses, and, and that's really what we do, right? Mm -hmm. Think about Holocaust and genocide studies, for instance, a great example. It's comparative. The notion that the tragedies of the Holocaust perhaps loom, not perhaps, but do, larm, loom the largest. But how do we put that in conversation with other travesties? How do we, how do we um, somehow cultivate wisdom out of comparison, right? That Oker Harim. How do we take our mountaintop, that knowledge that we have of Hey Siri, and how do we flip it mm -hmm. over uh, to make good use of it? And I, I think that's a challenge of educators. And by educators, I mean people who are professionally educators. But if you're aunts and uncles, um, if, if you are, you know, a mentor to anyone, how do you teach knowledge? You know, it's like uh, Maimonides lived 1138 to 1204 and was born in Cordova. What use is that, right? I happen <laughs> to know it, but you, anybody could Google it and look on Wikipedia. There's a debate, was he born in 1135 or 1138? Okay, so that is a bit of a, of a conundrum. But it's a question of how do we use that? And what's so great is that, you know, uh, I only started two months ago. I like to tell um, <laughs> our partners and our staff is that, thank goodness in two months, I haven't come up with a new idea that we've all been part of this wonderful thought process and how we do education. Right. And I think in some ways, um, the, the, the silver lining of this, um, uh, the fact that we have so much information at our fingertips in a way draws us back as educators to the core of learning, which is that relationship between teacher and learner and among learners. Um, just like uh, in the medical profession, you know, some years ago, there was a sort of, you know, hair pulling, like, what do we do? You know, what, what, what's going to be the need for doctors if everything, you know, if you can scan your, get your, uh, your prescription by scanning your, your skin or your eyes or whatever, but actually it, it brings back that uh, the connection that doctors need to have with their patients, just like teachers and their students. Um, so I think that is, you know, something that is important. And, and as we know, in learning, that relationship is so key. And, and how do physicians, how do experts, um, it, how are they trained to leverage that knowledge that used to be held among the elites and how do they right. transform it even more? Um, is a really interesting question. It, it really does challenge us to up our game. What do you do when anybody could, uh, you know, uh, yeah, but I, I would say, uh, 
No, uh, somebody commented to me in my one of my in my last book. I thanked the Facebook community, social media, for help in providing some sources and materials. Scholars do not have a monopoly on wisdom. Um, thank goodness, and, and we have allies throughout. And uh, it's a reminder that wisdom is in silo, is that it's part of a greater partnership. Mm -hmm. And information is not wisdom. Information is not expertise. And how to so, write, how to tell, I love that, I love that, Naomi, how to leverage information, how to elevate information to transform it, to make it much more sacred wisdom is, is very right. I'll use that. Right. <laughs> so we have a comment here. Um, uh, from Jerry Silverman, one of our fabulous alum, uh, uh, wishing, uh, offering a Yesher Koach and just noting that once he was told long ago, as he said here, that to be a great teacher, you do not need to know everything, you just need to know where to find it. So very true. Um, thank you for that, Jerry. And uh, we also have a comment here from Debbie Aaron, who's a member of our team at Gratz. Uh, she notes here the sources that caution about forgetting were really interesting. Aside from discernment of truth in the proliferation of modern information through technology, are there other downsides to the technology boom? Great question, Debbie. Thank you. Man, I think I think this these materials helps understand. And uh, I see also in the question and answer, our board member and I'll say a mentor of mine is Rabbi Lance Sussman, um, who asks about what is part of really what I'm generating from Rabbi Sussman's question is: Is this an opportunity to widen the canon? of Jewish learning? Um, are there more pressing issues that we can leverage? Um, and the answer of course is yes, that was an easy one. So many times the historian says, you're both right, but in this case, absolutely. This is an opportunity to widen the canon of interest and topics uh, that concern us. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question here from Aline Yokut, I think is the name, I don't have my glasses on. Uh, she notes here, Rabbi Google does not democratize knowledge, but does it superficially and doesn't create scholars. The level of learning among those who are learning in the traditional methods are far more systematically knowledgeable. And she'd like you to comment on that. I think that's right. I think that's probably a, on, that's part of that, um, that trade-off of that democratization. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, information is widely available, but what to do with it, and first of all, how to discern correct from not so correct information is a challenge, but it's superficial. Um, just today, uh, I, had a, I was um, in services this morning, actually. Uh, a friend approached me toward the end and pointed out that something that I said wasn't correct because Wikipedia suggested something else which I then you opened up my Dropbox and I sent them a fine article by Laura Liebman. To the contrary, um, there are um, different um, depths of learning. Um, I still do believe in education and in, in the PhD. Uh, that, that's, that's really important. Um, but I also am uh, not an elitist to suggest that all deep learning and thought is um, held within those who have many years of training. I think that we, we should still um, be sensitive to everybody gets that spark. And uh, like uh, the Divrei David, right, Rabbi Avram David Warman suggested, make sure you, you share that before that spark uh, goes away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, did you, uh, we have a question in here from Rabbi Sussman. Did you already respond yes, to that? I, 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 thought okay. I, I thought you did, yes, okay. Okay, I don't know that I see any other questions here. So if you'd like to make some final comments and then we can close it out, I think we can do that. Yeah, so I, I love the discussion. It's made me uh, think differently. I, I've said certain things in the questions that made me think about canon and superficiality and depth. And it's, it, it's really, to me, an example of, of, of that sharing of that partnership. And I think that um, what, and I have a lot to say and to our community and to have discussions right now in a webinar format, it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, this represents something that Gratz is quite good at, which is convening these conversations and being a partner in the cultivation of wisdom. Um, the number of partners we have throughout the spectrum of North American Jewish life, nobody holds um, that, uh, that, that dynamism and elasticity of partnerships. Nobody, few organizations, maybe outside of the synagogue, 
uh, space have a reach from young people to uh, veteran adults. Um, and so Gratz exercises, I think, um, a certain um, nobility in this space. Uh, I like to think so at least, is that um, I'm proud uh, you know, to work with Naomi and to work with our chancellor, Paul Finkelman and so many others. And of course our, uh, our board chair, Kathy Elias and I can name drop everybody. Owen Williams, our, 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 our vice chair. Um, I think what we share is a commitment uh, for everybody to share their Torah, to share their wisdom um, on the proposition that we can't dare forget it, that I, this is my Torah and I hope you find it to be good Torah. I think that's something I wanna stick with. Wonderful, thank, thank you. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us at Gratz and all of you who joined us tonight. Uh, this was such an insightful and thoughtful presentation for all of us who care about the future of Jewish learning. Um, so we, um, I, I did want to share um, that we don't have dates yet, but in early February, President Elif will be teaching an eight week course as part of our continuing adult education program uh, that's based on his book, Authentically Orthodox. So as many of you have may notice, as I have, Orthodox Judaism has been, is been in the media a great deal. Um, there's reality shows on Netflix and uh, all kinds of interesting uh, media out there about it. And so um, I like to take this class myself because it is allowing us to really um, look closely at, at Orthodox Judaism and look at American faith in full depth, really exploring um, how a tradition bound faith finds its rhythm in modern culture. So uh, this class is for anyone interested in the ebbs and flows of American religion and modern Jewish life. Um, and the best part about it is you get a complimentary copy of Dr. Elif's recent book. So what, that, you know, what, it, what how, can't get any better than that. Um, so thank you again. Um, all of these programs that we do at Gratz rely on your, the support of our community. Um, so if you are interested in learning how to be a donor, how to give back to Gratz, you can reach out to me. Um, you can go to our website, gratz.edu. Um, and there is actually a very special opportunity to support Gratz and to be part of our community in a really, really fun way. We have a very creative and unique event coming up on Sunday, November 21st. It's a celebration of our community. Um, we're now in our 126th year as an institution. Um, many of you celebrated our 125th anniversary with us last year. Uh, so this year, uh, Dr. Elif will be uh, helping us toast to the future of Gratz, literally with a, a nice bottle of kosher champagne. And um, this is an online event and uh, you can register for it online. Um, but what I'm gonna do is not talk about it anymore, but actually I invite you to stay on for another minute and a half or so. We have a special sort of invitation by song from the gentleman who's going to be the MC of this program, uh, Kenny Ellis. He is a Gratz alum. He's a professional actor, a jazz music musician, a cantor. We love him and uh, we're so glad he's gonna MC this program. It's a really wonderful program of storytelling. We're gonna have prizes, of course, champagne. Um, and so we hope you um, think about joining us, whether you're a donor, an alumnus, a uh, continuing adult ed participant, you're all welcome. And so with that, I'm going to close the program and ask you to just stay on for another moment and hear this wonderful invitation. Thank you. Grats College. Oh, hi, Kenny Ellis here, actor, musician, cantor, and Grats alumnus. Wondering which year? Well, you can find out when you come to Gratz's big celebration event on Sunday, November 21st. Alumni and students from the 1960s to the present are going to touch your heart with their Gratz stories. There's going to be a trivia contest with prizes. You can hear music, share memories, and drink a champagne toast to Gratz's future with the new college president. Now, to register, it's only $18. Hi. And for a little bit more, Gratz will send you your very own bottle of bubbly. Not bad, huh? This is going to be a lot of fun and a way to support an institution that we all love. So join me and many other of your friends on Sunday, November 21st at 4 p.m. Eastern. Help spread the word and click on the link below to register today. I hope to see you there. Gratz College.